Um, we have been journeying through um, a study on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so um, and the name of this series has been Shifting the Atmosphere. Uh, and simply put, um, God is always shifting the atmosphere. Uh, God has always changed. Wherever there's darkness, he brings light. Whenever there's brokenness, he comes and he can shift the atmosphere and bring restoration. God is just in the business of changing everything broken on the earth, shifting the atmosphere for his glory uh, and for his name and changing the lives of his kids. And one of those major ways um, that he does this, so you come to Jesus, and just to recap, and today's the end of our series after 12 uh, different lessons, teaching sermons on this, um, but as we talk about the whole time, you come to Jesus, the Lord gives you grace and forgiveness as you surrender your life to him. It's spontaneous. Uh, and then from there on, he put his Holy Spirit in you, like God lives in you. Fruit of that starts to come out of you. Love, joy, peace, patience. It's not perfect, but he starts to change you from the inside out. And the scriptures say, and then he also gives us um, uh, this, these things called gifts. And by the way, they're called gifts. What is significant about something called a gift? It is a gift. gift. Man, you guys are on it today. Um, so, uh, but these things are, are pretty important. And uh, unfortunately, as we've been journeying, they're also pretty controversial in the church. And, um, but all I know is this. is like as we've moved forward, I personally, and just speaking to you here, I, God has just been blessing my socks off as we've grown through this and, and journey through this. You know, people, um, this, this whole journey is about Jesus. It's not about, you know, super, super size this, me, this, look at that. It's not about that. Like Jesus has given us, the scripture is clear. He has given us gifts, gifts for his kingdom, gifts for the edification of his church. Just means to get built up, that we are built up. We get edified in it, built up, and the church gets edified, built up in it. it they are, it is the hands. He is an intimate father with his children. Many of us have struggled with that in a big way. And, and to me, the gifts are just continuing proof that Jesus is still very alive and active in the heart of his folk uh, in this church who call him by his name. Amen? And so here's what we found is like all these really controversial and scary topics that we talked about that are so jacked up in the church with gifts, they're not really controversial at all. Abuses are abuses. They've been going on since the beginning of the church. Uh, that doesn't negate the fact that just because man messes something up and even in good intentions messes something up, it doesn't negate the fact that what God has given us is real, that it's a gift. And we don't all have to agree on all those things. Amen? Amen. Well, well, most of them we want to agree on. Amen? And so I've been talking about these two camps, and I want to talk about this a little bit. You know, there's this camp over here where folks that were raised in very, very traditional uh, mindsets, very conservative, and if you talk about anything about the Holy Spirit, it better just be a doctrinal piece. And then the other side of it is a lot of you and a lot of us have come from settings where we were raised in a very, very, uh, I would like to say nicely, overactive environment of the gifts where there was a lot of things going on. There might've been good things going on, but there was also some things in there that just don't seem biblically clear. And so we have these two camps and they always seem to be uh, at each other. They both, this side over here looks and says, man, why don't they read their Bible, you bunch of knuckleheads? And over here, they're going, man, why don't you just feel the presence of God? And they're, they're always like this, this tension but I would like to say, uh, I don't think neither are necessary and um, are really the heart and base of the church. I think they're right. It's right here. It's right in the middle, full of God's word and truth and who he is that doesn't contradict the fact that he works in supernatural ways in his church. And it's just clear. And I have been, I'm honestly, I'm, I'm so encouraged and I'm heartbroken at the same time. I'm encouraged by what I think that God just really clearly says in his word. And I'm also astonished by how many people live without walking and knowing the power of the Holy Spirit because they're afraid of something. Like, it breaks my heart. Like, what do we need in this country? We need more, we need more wisdom? Or do we need the wisdom of a supernatural God who falls on his church and does... We need supernatural. This is what I'm talking about. What do I mean by that? We need, we need God to move. No more church trying to entertain people and, and all those things have a place, I guess, but all that stuff is fine. But the only thing that changes people's lives is a move of God. And by the way, that is always supernatural. When God moves and he rescues a man or a woman, guess what? That's not freaky deaky. That's Holy Spirit. God is moving through and changing our, who breaks the heart of addicts? Who, who, who cures the cancers in, in, in men and women's body? Who, 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 who brings restoration in just broken relationships that, are, that have been dead for years? It's not just 
sound doctrine and good intentions that does that. It is a move of the Spirit of God in His people working through doctrine, working through His church. They all come together in one piece. And so, uh, but there's a third group of people that I haven't talked about enough, and that is not those folks over here, not those folks of here, but the people that are right here. So most of you in this church, many of you are new believers. Many of you didn't come with the baggage that many of us came with and trying to work out all the baggage that we've had for all these years. Um, and not and baggage is, is helpful sometimes, obviously. You gotta go somewhere, you gotta bring some draws, right? So you need baggage. But these people right here in the middle, uh, I wanna talk to you because some of you have been like, I have no idea what this conversation is that you're talking about. Um, you, you, you stir my heart the most. I've often felt that us who have been a part of the church for a while, and I, I used to not be in that group, and as I get older, I'm in that group, right? I'm like 20 years in on this thing. It used to be, ah, I'm not, I've never been a believer for long. Well, it's like 20 years now, so I can't really get out of that. So I'm one of you old, cratchety believer people. And so, but the people in the middle who are just open and learning, I've often felt like this older generation of folk in the church, we're just gonna have to die to ourselves and all of our preconceives and hand off a more truth of Jesus and less baggage to the next generation. And in that next generation, not saying he's not going to use us, he's going to use us, but we're going to have to die for that generation to be able to live without the baggage that we have and move on. The gifts are one of those topics where I would love to see generations of our church and churches in the future and however many we plant or wherever we go, if you leave this place today with an openness to the true things of the Spirit of God, not abuse, not over neglect, and it's just normal. Like it's normal. Hey, we, we heard from the Lord today in church. That was awesome. We saw somebody get healed. We were praying and I mean, all these things. Uh, you know, I was operating my gifts today. Like that is just, that's, that's what New Testament talk is. That's what was happening in New Testament. It wasn't a weird subject. Let's just get on to Jesus. It's an extension of his grace and mercy. It's his power working in us and it's a gift. And so if you say, I don't want that gift, think about it for a minute. I don't want it, Lord. I'm afraid of it. I don't want that gift. Yeah, it's kind of scary. And so as we move forward, um, here's some of our biggest obstacles. This series ends today. Now what? Uh, like many teachings and mountaintop experiences or whatever, uh, if you don't start to apply these things to your life, it doesn't mean anything. If we don't try as a church to begin to put in some patterns and some hope and some actual walking through and being open to these things, guess what? It dies. And we need to live this out personally with our Father. Oh, the Lord still speaks to me and I can speak to Him and, and He's with me and He's given me these gifts. God, I wanna understand what that is. Uh, the way we pray, how we love our homes, lo looking, looking for signs and wonders in your children, right? Like mom and dads, like you are the first and foremost uh, shepherds of your children's hearts and that includes their gifting. Like some, and sometimes people are like, well, they're children, they don't understand. What does the scripture say about a child? We're supposed to have faith like them. Sometimes I think that kids can operate in their gifts easier than we can because we've either been taught over here or taught over here and we're carrying all this luggage and our kids are like, mom, I just heard the Lord say. Everybody tracking with me? We've got to map this thing out. The way we serve one another in our times of worship, we have to create an environment um, that is biblically open to what God is doing so we can flesh these things out. Amen? They're called gifts for a reason. Piper says this about the gifts. He says, um, God has given spiritual gifts as a means of ministry to his people, and these gifts are points of supernatural encounter with the living God in which he shows more of his power, more of his wisdom, and more of his love to his people. Just to remind you, as we've been walking and trying to be open to the gifts, what does the scripture say about how we deal with these gifts? 1 Corinthians 14.1 says this, just the first part of it. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. I just want to say this for the last time today. I know I've said it before over the last number of weeks, but here's the deal. Paul doesn't just say, hey, uh, be open to the gifts. This, by the way, when Paul says it, he's speaking through the Holy Spirit. He didn't say like he does in other places, like 1 Corinthians 7 in different places, hey, this is my own opinion. This isn't from the Lord. He is saying these are commands when they're coming from his apostles. They are working in this prophetic voice of God in his doctrine and in the Bible and canon. He says, guess what? Earnestly pursue the gifts. He never says, hey, I'd really like you to be open to the Holy Spirit and the gifts. He says, earnestly pursue them. As we talked about before, that what is earnestly? I guess I'll check out the gifts. Right? No, it's like, I want them. God, I want them. God, give them to me. I, I, I want to see you move. I want you to use me to edify your church. And so the big question that I've dealt with over this last series is, is it possible that people are in sin 
if they are not pursuing what God has for them? The answer is, yeah. When God, imagine, put in any other topic, take out gifts, put in love, put in forgiveness, put in grace, put in serving, put in any other thing, and you and I wouldn't even have to have a conversation about this, would we? Hey, earnestly pursue love. I'm all in. Earnestly pursue serving one another. Yep, that's the word of the Lord. Paul said it. It's from the Lord. I'm going to serve, or at least I'm going to fight myself and serve. At least I'm going to fake it. And then when the gifts, and he says, earnestly pursue the gifts, and people go, no. So I think people need to be careful. I think people need to be lovingly careful when it comes to this stuff. And so is openness a start? Yes. (laughs) But we need to figure out what it is to honestly pursue them. Amen? And so here's what we've covered over the last number of weeks. We started in Ephesians 4, and there's all kinds of, of gifts that we've talked about. We've covered 19 the, some of them double up. Some people think that this is a gift and there's other places. There are other gifts that aren't listed here, but we've, we've done 19 of them, if you can believe that, Holla, and only took 12 sermons. Amen. That's amazing. We started in Ephesians 4, and Ephesians 4 talked about these people gifts. These are different than the charisma, a gift that comes on a person. This is a person that God supernaturally puts in the church with supernatural gifting for the edification of the church. And those, those were what? Do you remember? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers or pastor teachers. So there, those people placed in the church are actually supernatural gifts from God for edification of the church. That was Ephesians 4. And then we slowly went through Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 and talked about the rest of these gifts. We talked about in one week service, exhortation, which is encouraging people with God's word and his way and giving. The next one we talked about was leadership, administration, and mercy. Those are all spiritual gifts. Then we talked about a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom and discernment. And then we talk, spent a week on what it is to have supernatural, uh, God-given faith and healing and miracles. Last two weeks ago, we talked about tongues and interpretation of tongues. Ah! Which, by the way, this is one of those topics where, you know, you think you're going to, you know, I always go into things with my head down a little bit and beat up a lot as a kid. And so, uh, you know, I go in and, and it's funny when we talk about tongues. As you go through the Bible and just like simply line it out, I had more people come up to me last week and say, man, I'm so glad you explained that. That is not that big of a deal. I think it's awesome. And I'm like, don't get me, right? I'm like running out, as, running out to the car as fast as a chubby man can run, amen? And then this week, we're going to end our time kind of recircling around this one topic of prophecy. Everybody say prophecy. prophecy. So when you say prophecy, Uh, Don't answer this, but in your heart, what is the first thing that pops up to mind? I'll tell you what I was taught uh, from the beginning of when I was a believer. So I was uh, baptized into a church family who loved very much and good people there, but we were way over here. And so when we talked about, um, we talked about the Holy Spirit, it it was a doctrinal thing. I make fun of it, but literally it was, it was Father, Son, and Holy Bible. I mean, that was our Trinity, literally. And so the Holy Spirit existed, but it was a lesson. And so when you talk about gifts and when you said things like prophecy, this is what I was taught. Prophecy exists today, but the only way prophecy exists today is in sermons because all prophecy is is a word from the Lord and preaching the word of God is prophecy. It's a sermon. That's what it is. If anybody talks about any other kind of prophecy, they're nut jobs talking about the end of the world and they're all wacko. That was essentially in in greater tender terms. That was what I was taught. I was taught that either it's preaching God's word or wackos. By the way, it's a good sermon series. That's my next one coming up any day now. Amen. (laughs) So once again, I was set in those roots. And then uh, as a loving God, like you heard me talk about a couple weeks ago when I talked about how I was like hateful to the idea of tongues and stuff, God took me on a journey that said, "Mm -mm, shut your mouth, watch this. And we began to sit, I I told you this story many times where we sat down at World Mandate, I don't know how many years ago it was ago, 10, 11, 12 years ago, and sat down and we signed up for this prophecy time, prophetic prayer ministry time, and I was all ready to kung fu ninja this dude with his bad doctrine. And this, uh, and you've heard me say it a million times, for those of you who haven't, this old Scottish guy is very prophetic guy, literally, pokes, and he's, you know, I can't do it. He's like Sean Connery giving you prophecy, which makes it way cooler, right? Here's the word of the Lord. <laughs> anyway, anyways, but he sits down, and I'm just like, all right, I'm like, Taren, this is going to be stupid. And we sat there, and then I'm telling you, this guy brought a, a word that could have only been from the Lord to my wife, to myself, 
we were undone. And once again, Rob Dans and all of his masterful theology was undone by the Spirit of the Lord going, oh, what I believed and what I was taught and what I just experienced are two very different things. God, help me bridge the gap. And so we went on a journey. And then the weird thing started where I started to realize that this was part of my gifting. Like this prophetic thing, like God's speaking to me over, like I would just have these things in my heart. And I'd be like, mm -mm, I'm, just, I'm such a smart man. How did I know that? And then I went, no, no, I forgot. I'm me. I'm not a smart man. Uh, that must be from the Lord. And God would start speaking and working these things in me. And it would just blow my doors off time and time and time again. God was teaching me. And so here's our boom for today. The boom is just our big idea. The Lord is a father who is near to his children. He speaks to us through his word and capitalized on purpose and directly to our hearts through one another with revelations of who he is and what his heart is for us. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you'll find uh, one of the various places where the gift of prophecy is. I'll read this 1 Corinthians 12 verses 10. This is Paul lining out to the Corinthian church all of the gifts, um, most of the gifts. And he says this in verse 10, to another, the working of miracles. He's, he's describing all these spiritual gifts. He says, to another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. The gift of prophecy is a charisma, which is the base of charismata, which is the, the namesake of charismatic. What it means is it's this Holy Spirit-given thing that God drops on you, the supernatural thing that is beyond you, that is in him, that he works through you. That is what this charisma is. And so he says prophecy is a charisma. So number one, just a reminder, it's from the Holy Spirit and it's for what purpose? Edification of the church. What does it mean to edify? Build up, strengthen, grow, right? It's for uh, his heart for us is to grow. So the word prophecy uh, in the Greek, it means the ability to receive a divinely inspired message and deliver it to others in the church. Pro listen to this. Prophecy is the human report of a divine revelation, okay? And here's the thing about prophecy. Unlike some of the other gifts, Paul spends a lot of time giving special care to prophecy. And so as we look in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul says this at the beginning, 1 Corinthians 14, 1, pursue love here it is again, earnestly desire the gifts, especially that you might prophesy. Listen to that. Paul is saying something. That there's something key. That's why we've left it for the end here and why I think it's so vitally important for us as the church. Paul says, especially that you might prophesy. And then it moves on in 1 Thessalonians 5.20. It says, do not despise prophecy. So we have two problems with this doesn't live here theology. Number one, Paul says you need to earnestly desire it, uh, and especially prophecy. And by the way, do not despise prophecy. Don't. Last two weeks ago, we talked about tongues and the gift of tongues and what it simply means scripturally. And Paul talks a lot in 1 Corinthians 14, here's the deal. In the Corinthian church, they were very carnal. They were very, they lived in a very worldly society. There was vomitories, which if you don't know what a vomitory is, go and look it up when you get home. It's awesome. I'm pretty sure it's like a modern hometown buffet mixed with a brothel. I don't know what it was, but anyway. Uh, but there were these vomitories going on, right? And so the, all this stuff, they were very carnal and gifts exploded in the church. And the problem was they grabbed onto these sensational ones like tongues and different things like that, and they were running with it. And so Paul, they were abusing it. And so Paul comes back to them, and that's what 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 is all about. It is Paul admonishing them and exhorting them and correcting them and encouraging them to how to use them in the correct way. And so, in, in, like we've already talked about, um, what we talk about in tongues, this, this look at this quote from this uh this African theologian guy. <laughs> I knew that, Dan's. I knew that. I'm just an idiot. My name is Dan's, if you don't know. I just make up these stupid names because I need people to like me. So this great African scholar said this, creamy fellow. Uh, what was powerful about tongues was that it was primarily, it should say, is primarily between God and us. 
we communicating with him through the spirit. So we learned last time that tongues is us speaking to God, but in a way, with moanings and groanings, this thing from in us, this prayer that goes up to the Lord that's from us to him. But he is orchestrating it through the Holy Spirit and through power. And it happens in publicly only when there's interpretation because it's a word from God. That person doesn't know what it is, but someone is given the gift of interpretation. So that gift was this, from us to him. Here's the parallel with prophecy. What's powerful about prophecy is that it's him directly communicating to us through the Spirit and to one another. So tongues, in most cases, without interpretation, is always us to him. It's an intimate thing. Prophecy is that flipped up on its head. It is him directly communicating the Father, speaking to his children, his sons and daughters, words of encouragement and exhortation from him to us. It is also intimate. And this is why Paul makes such an enormous stink about when you're in the public setting, if there's no interpretation, be quiet. I would rather have, five, it doesn't say tongues are bad and they don't exist. He's talking about in a specific scenario, take that to your closet or have interpretation. That's between you and the Lord, unless he's going to bring a way to share it. But prophecy, when you guys are together, prophesy, give words, pray to God would give you a word because why? It is God's direct revelation to all of us. We all get blessed when people obey and walk in their gift of prophecy. Amen? Amen. <laughs> we need to hear from the Lord. Here's what I've come to, and I, I just this is where people start to check out. I think you're an emotional wreck, but <laughs> we, need, we need to hear from the Lord. Like, I don't know about you, this is what changed in my life. You know what happened to that minute in me when I heard the Lord speaking through that old Scottish guy to me? You know what happened? The scriptures, it's a miracle, but the scriptures were something I went from that was in my head and I was trying to get in my heart and it exploded inside of my heart because the God of the scriptures, the God, the Logos spoke to me specifically. I needed to hear from my father in heaven. I needed to hear his voice. I know what he says in his word. His word is complete and his word is full. But just because his word is full and infallible doesn't mean that God doesn't speak to his kids directly anymore. He's always done it. He walked with Adam and Eve. He spoke with them. They broke the covenant. He, they were separated from him, but he still kept talking to them through patriarchs of the church, through men and these prophets and these kings. He was still speaking all the time. What was the, prophet, what was the problem in the end of Malachi to the birth of Jesus, those 400 years? What did they say was the issue? God was silent. They had his word they had the Torah, they had the scrolls, but God was not speaking to them anymore. And they were devastated. New covenant comes, Jesus. Jesus gives his life on the cross. The veil is torn. He is resurrected. The separation between God and man is gone. Now there's a bridge. It's the blood of Christ, the body of Christ. Now he's in us. Why for a minute would the God of creation, who's been intimately close with his creation, would he give his Holy Spirit, break the curse of death, break the curse of separation, and not still speak to his children? When that restoration has been his heart from day one. Why? Everybody tracking? <clears throat> prophecy, I just say this. Prophecy to me is the rekindling of intimacy with his children. Like, listen, God speaks. God speaks through his word, and God also reveals things to his sons and daughters. Why? He's a daddy. He speaks to his kids. And just because people mess it up doesn't mean that it's not real. Amen? Do not despise prophecies. Um, so the question, moving on, what does Paul say? Where does, what does prophecy um, come from? And so it, Paul calls it something special, just to kind of walk through the point here. 1 Corinthians 14, 30, Paul says this, If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. So Paul calls, they're talking about a prophetic word in the church, and he calls it a revelation. Everybody say Revelation. It's revealing something. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, 2, back a chapter, it says, if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge, 
He's talking about this. When God reveals something, it's a mystery. It's a revelation. The word reveal in the Greek happens 26 times. And the noun revelation happens 18 times. And Sam Storm says, in every instance, the reference is to divine activity. God revealing something about himself, not just human activity in, in, in reading something necessarily from his word. And so Storm says this, prophecy, therefore, is not based on a hunch a supposition, an inference, an educated guess, or even on sanctified wisdom. Prophecy is not based on personal insight, intuition, or illumination. Prophecy is the human report of divine revelation. So here's the question. Can God reveal something to you outside of his word? How many of you, and I don't mean to say this to be facetious, but how many of you stood at the base of the Rockies and said, man, this mountain is beautiful because the Bible told me so. I'm not, I don't believe me. I don't mock the word of God. I'm, I'm dead serious about the inerrancy of the word of God. But how did you get, or did you get a revelation of how good God was? As you, have, have you got to get revelation of when your children are following after the Lord? Did you get a revelation? This is what I'm saying. Does God still, I looked at the mountains and went, wow, God is so good. Look at what he's done. Look at what he's done. Like God revealed that to me. He's revealed so many things through the scriptures, but there are different things that he's revealed to me outside of the scripture. By the way, that doesn't make you a Bible-hating wag job. You hear what I'm saying? Most people say, and this is the fear, okay? And I get it. The fear is if we walk that way and God still reveals stuff to us, to his people, then there's a chance that we're gonna come over here and ruin the inerrancy of God's word and people are gonna go off the charts. And have they? Y'all, this is the direct reason why the Jehovah's Witnesses exist. They are not upon the word of God. Someone got a new revelation and they believed what this, these two scholars totally tweaked certain words of the Bible in their own interpretation within the last hundred years and completely walked their folks away from heaven. Mormonism, Joseph Smith gets a word from the Lord. He has dreams and visions, he says, completely walks away from the canon of Scripture and what the Lord says. Those things are very real. Those are not Jesus-following places, and there's, and there's hundreds of them. But in the end, does the fact that a man can mess up the message negate the fact that the message is still true? <laughs> The word is complete and infallible. No prophecy is ever legitimate if for a second it seems to even contradict God's word. Amen? But God is always talking to his children in align with his word. Amen? So as we look at prophecy, this is through the Old Testament and the New Testament. We've covered this a little bit, but I just want to recap is there a difference? Because people will use that argument that I just made and say, but look, man, you go read the book of Joel and the little horns of the whatever that is. By the way, there's just awesome stuff about the end of times and, and things that are very hard to get your mind around, by the way. Okay, and so if, you, if so prophecy, if there's still prophecy, then that's the prophecy we have, the thus saith the Lord thing. Uh, we could prophesy the end of time and all the stuff could come. And so if the Bible is closed as far as not adding to it, then if we have that gift, that seems to be a contradiction. Well, here's the deal. In the Old Testament, prophecy and New Testament prophecy are two different things. And so in the, in the Old Testament, they spoke the authoritative word directly from the mouth of God. God is transcribing them into people like Moses. They're, right? Remember the tablets? He had 15 and he dropped one on the way down. Okay. I don't even remember what movie that was. It's probably something not good. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> but God spoke directly to certain people, and that was his word. So when the New Testament comes, here's, here's the rad part. That was because there was separation between God and his people, and only a few amount of men were able to hear this, um, uh, this word. Well, in the New Testament, the New Covenant, what happens? Jesus breaks the law. He not breaks the law. He fulfills the law. Excuse me. He, he is, he is, he is um, the one that gives this new relationship back to us where we are in the presence of God. Now everybody can hear the word of the Lord. What would be the problem? When you expand numbers, you're going to expand errancy. And so when we talk about stuff like that, like, oh, if everybody could probably, and I've, <laughs> I can't tell many times I've had this. Well, God gave me a word. Well, that seems to contradict the Bible. 
Yeah, I know, but as God gave it to me, I know it was. I know how to hear God's voice. People get mad. I know how to hear God's voice. I heard the word of the Lord. No, you didn't. And so the New Testament has this amazing, amazing next step. It's called test everything. Everybody say test everything. <laughs> test everything. Listen to this. The New Testament. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 through 21, we talked about the beginning of this. Do not despise prophecies in verse 21, but test everything and hold fast to what is good. So here's the deal. Divine revelation comes. uh, (laughs) Divine receiving is not always the case. So even what, no matter what I say, you should never walk out of here thinking that what I say is inerrant. You're not allowed to. You're not allowed to do that. I'm a human. Don't put that on me. You need to test it. You need to read your word. It doesn't mean you get combative and, and my pastor's an idiot. You got to start a new blog, the stuff Rob jacked up today. I will have one of my kids come over and kick you in the shins, right? <clears throat> but you, you, don't, you don't take anything on TV, any pastor, no pope, nobody, that they are inerrant in their word. You test everything. Amen. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 29 through 33. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. Listen, so this is the public setting. Now Paul is talking about these benefits of prophecy. So if prophecy is going on, number one, it's not everybody prophesying all over the place. He says two or three, and then whoever else is not prophesying, guess what they're supposed to do? Weigh it, test it, test it, weigh it, weigh it, test it. Why? Because men screw up. But... Paul doesn't say, hey, there's a chance we could screw up God's word here. Let's just not. He says, absolutely. He says, prophesy, test it. Amen? 1 John 4, 1 through 3. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world, and by this you should know the spirit of God. Every spirit, listen, that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Now listen to this. This isn't only saying the content you need to check for. You need to check from where it came from. Understand what I'm saying? Because it is clear in the spiritual warfare, there are other things that give I guess you can't call it divine revelation. They give these supernaturally wicked revelations, right? Like when we start talking about mediums and stuff like this, am I right? Like people are like, hey, how'd you know about my grandmama? Do you think for a minute all of that stuff is just fake? Or do you think that there are spirits? This is saying test those spirits. Listen, there are things talking to us from the other side of the line and you need to test it. If that doesn't add up with God's word, if it says anything in contradiction with God's word or the truth of Jesus, nix it. Nix it. By the way, can you see why it's so important to know your word? If you continue to live without a passion and a zeal for your word and you're illiterate, you will easily be run over by the enemy thinking things that sound good are actually truth when they're not truth at all. Amen? Amen. So who is the gift of prophecy for? And so the answer is, is easy. It's, it's, it's for the church and for unbelievers. But listen to this. Um, 1 Corinthians 14, 4 through 3. Or three through four. I'm not going to read it backwards. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds himself up. By the way, go back to two weeks ago. Is that always a bad thing? No, we can be edified. This is in a public setting, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. So what does prophecy do? It builds us up. And he, he gets specific in 14 verse 3. He says, for it, it, when the one who prophesies, they do this. They, they bring up building. What is up building? When God speaks, new believers, old believers, what it is, we need to be encouraged. God can speak words into you that build you up. He can bring encouragement. I can't tell you how many times in my life where I was just feeling like a wee little lad that God had nothing to do with me. I was messing everything up and I would just pray as, as I've been walking this journey. Jesus, I don't want to be selfish. Your word is sufficient. Like this is the old reformer in me fighting with myself, right? Your word is sufficient. But God, if you would, Lord, I need to hear from you. I just feel like garbage. And I'm, I kid you not, I've prayed that one time and I've had a guy come by me and just say, uh, this was at a conference, and he said, hey, uh, man, I was just walking by and just felt like the Lord told me that he is not disappointed in you. He absolutely loves you. He is for you, not against you. 
Bah. And he walked away. And so you can go, hey, that guy's just really good at looking at jacked up looking people and giving them encouragement. Or the Lord really spoke encouragement to me. And I'm, many people in this room have had similar things. Consolation, the heart of God ministering to someone in heartache. Amen? Like how many times have we seen that where God will speak a word through somebody for a family? We've seen it through people that lost babies. Amen? that have just lost babies, infertility, thing after thing after thing where God would send on heart of a tender, open person and say, honey, I know this is where you are, but this is the heart of Jesus. And I feel like he's saying this, test it, but this is what I feel God is saying. And then what happens? What do you do in the middle of the brokenness of your life when you're going through losing a child or relationships and the word of God is there for you, but the, the voice of God speaks through you through somebody else. What does it do? <laughs> gives you comfort, gives you strength. By the way, he, again, let me say, he is a father that speaks to his children. Amen? Here's some other forms. <laughs> uh, God can build up through, through prophecy. God, God uses it for correction. Some people say, well, no, no, no. No, no, the Bible says the prophecy is only for edification. I have to be honest with you. Uh, I get that. It does say that. What is more edifying than you living in sin and God bringing corrective word to you and you, not, you walking away from your sin and being back in right relationship with him, right? What, about, what if that was a true in Nineveh, right? Jonah walked in, <laughs> you know what I mean? What was God's heart? God's heart for them was restoration. God's heart wasn't just beating on them. When God disciplines, it is an act of edification because when we change and we draw away from the crap we're grabbing onto and we draw near to him, we are edified. There's no greater edification than the presence and the arms and will of Christ. Amen? I'll say amen to that 10 times because that was a good point. I don't care what y'all say. <laughs> I just pat myself on the back. Good work. Um, so prediction of future events. We'll talk about that one in a minute. That's a contested one. Inspiration. Uh, there's some weird things in the scripture at point to like prophecy seems to be able to reveal hidden things. Like in 1 Corinthians 14, 25, they're talking about this unbeliever being in the service where prophecies going on. In verse 25, it says, the secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. Like, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but God will give you a word and you think you're hiding behind something. Again, for your edification, you have some secret thing locked in your heart and someone will come and say, hey, we see this in David, right? Who calls David out? Nathan, right. So Nathan, right. So he, he, he has this affair with Bathsheba. He, she gets pregnant. He freaks out, has her husband killed and he is walking around like nothing's going on. And the Lord just downloads this thing into Nathan. And then Nathan says, hey, let me tell you this story. And he uses this story to tell about this whole injustice. And David goes, that was, that's ridiculous. Bring me that. And then what does Nathan do? Hey, that's you. That's you. But what happened to David at that point? Whew, he repented. So God can reveal secret things in your heart for his glory, for your edification and the edification of the church. Amen. Um, Prophecy can lead to your calling. We see in Acts chapter 13, uh, they were worshiping. They were uh, at the church, one through three, at the church of Antioch, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menin, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called them to. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Seen this happen, where people were just, one, what am I going to do, Lord? And someone came up and says, hey, man, I just, I've seen this in nations and young people. I feel like the nation just said Japan. I don't know what that is. Test it. What happens? <laughs> they go. Here's another thing. Prophecy is, is, is weird. Acts chapter 14, it's not weird. But 9 through 10, listen to this. And he listened to Paul speaking. And Paul, looking intently at him and seeing he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, stand up upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. It seems that through a prophetic word, people can see things that, that uh, people were healed from. This guy, Paul said, he, it said Paul could see that he had the faith to be healed. Like that was given to him, divine inspiration from the Lord, a revelation. He could see that this dude was going to be healed. And he said, hey, stand up, walk. And what happened? And then they just manufactured the rest of the story. 
I believe this is what happened with my grandma. Like you've heard me say that, the stage four cancer in her chest. I cannot believe in a moment that out of my mouth, flying to my, my unsaved mom, I said, mom, I think God's gonna heal our grandma, my grandma, your mom, to show you that he exists and he's real. Never would I say that in a million years. What happens? Could that have been a revelation from the Lord? Or was I just having big spiritual gas that day and I got lucky? <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. That's what people, well, you just got lucky. Really? Really? I got, I got lucky. Mm -hmm. Prophecy could be a warning. Listen to this. Acts 21.4. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. There's this whole text about, it's funny because these guys are saying they have a word from the Lord for Paul not to go. And Paul's saying, I have a word from the Lord that I'm supposed to go. And so it's this interesting little, little area in Acts 21 of what happens. And by the way, what happens? He goes and see, they, they prophesied that he was going to go and be killed. He prophesied that he was going to go and be killed and he was supposed to. Theirs was fear. His was faith-based. They were loving him. Nothing wrong with that. But they were probably saying, look, you're going to be in a bad spot when you get there. And Paul says, yeah, I know. The Lord is calling me that way. Isn't it interesting how that works? <clears throat> uh, prophesy can be used to identify gifting in 1 Timothy 4.14. It's just the wording of Paul to Timothy. He says, do not neglect the gift you have, which was given to you by prophecy when the council elders laid their hands on you. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Interesting. So question, who scripturally is supposed to pursue the gifts? Is this just a man thing? Is this just an old person thing? Is this just a young person thing? Uh, I, I'm just putting this in here for simple repetition. Everybody. By the way, the New Testament is full of women prophets. Full of women prophets. They're just in there. One dude had four daughters. Can you imagine that whole Christmas time? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I know what you're getting me, Dad. Just be quiet. I'm just, it doesn't work that way. I'm just kidding. Uh, I lost some of you there. Now I'm a heretic. All right. Oh, God uses prophecy for gifts, huh? That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just, I'm just kidding. So let me, let me talk just a minute about some myths of prophecy um, that I think are pretty clear. And so number one, uh, people will say the prophecy did exist, but it was only through the Old Testament and it died with the apostles. And so we've talked about this verse before um, in Ephesians 2, 19 through 20. This is one of those verses that people point to, and I think try to make it say more than it does. But it says, you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. People will point to this and say, the existence of the supernatural, all these things were through Jesus, through the apostles. The foundation was set, and after the foundation, there was no need for these building blocks that were set for the foundation. God's word is sufficient and enough. Now, I appreciate that, but in the end, at best, the burden of proof is on you. Show me how in any way, shape, or form you can say with absolute certainty that that just said anywhere that those gifts do not exist. The Bible doesn't state anything close to that. Matter of fact, it seems to say the opposite. In the Old Testament, it was there. And with the apostles, gifts were there. It was clearly in the New Testament beyond the apostles. It was working in the New Testament. By the way, why would that be true if Paul, okay, if Paul, the greatest outreacher to Gentiles like us, if the, if the gifts were going to die with Paul, either he didn't know, or number two, there was something else going on, why would he be teaching a carnal uh, sometimes ungodly church on not only to stop abusing the gifts, but to earnestly pursue these gifts. Why would he teach them that and just walk away? And that wasn't supposed to happen. See, the gifts weren't a controversial subject in the Bible. They were church. They were church, right? We're the only ones that have made it a controversial topic. And so... Um, <laughs> Uh, seeking through that. And so um, here, here's another one that I've literally heard someone sit across my desk from me in the last uh, six weeks or so and tell me this. Prophecy is a proclamation, but never predictive. What I'm trying to say is it will, also, it will always reveal something about the Lord, but it'll never tell something coming in the future. It's not like that. People believe this. And some people, maybe even this room, I, I probably believe this in one shape or form or another. There's only one problem with this. It's the Bible. Listen, Acts 21, and I, I was taught the same thing. Acts 21, 10 through 11. 
This is working through a man who is not an apostle. He is a prophet. Uh, While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus uh, came down from Judea and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and his hands and says, thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. What did he do? That wasn't a past tense. It wasn't a present tense. He literally took his belt from his garment and said, listen, he tied up his hands and his feet. The one who owns this, this is how they're going to take him in Jerusalem. It was predictive. And guess what happened? That happened. Acts 27, verses 21 through 26. Since they had been without food for a long time, this is a funny story too in the, in the journey of Paul. Paul stood up, their shipwreck is coming. Paul stood up among them and said, men, You should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you. That's predictive. He knows, and listen to this, but only of the ship. What happens? The ship wrecks. They get on shore. None of them die. The ship is crushed, right? For this very night, there stood before me an angel of God, whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, (laughs) which again was his his word. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. I um, am intimately this story... um, Again, I've been sharing all kinds of things to make you know that I'm a quack. But so I talked a couple weeks ago, uh, a few weeks ago, about my friend Ashley, who was a missionary, um, laying her life down, has stage four cancer. She's overseas serving the Lord. They're praying, praying, praying. She's got a three and a half year old little baby girl. Uh, her and her husband Thomas have become my friends over the years. I just had lunch with them last week. But as I told you, she she died. She she passed away, and they they prayed for her to come back from the dead. And they were praying, they had her everywhere. But, but in the middle of this, I remember a few months before she died, I was standing in the auditorium um, at Antioch and I looked over and he was there. We were at a conference together and he was over on the other side of the aisle. And I remember worshiping and praising and saying, Jesus, give me a word to encourage Thomas. And so I'm just praying, I'm just praying. And then all of a sudden in, in my heart's eye, I look over at him and this is what I believe I saw. And you can discredit with everything, but Remember, I'm Captain Pessimist, so if I tell you these things, I'm promising you either I'm losing my mind or I saw them. I look over there, and I see Thomas worshiping, and all of a sudden I see a man standing in front of him, and he has this seed, this large glowing like seed, and he puts it inside of Thomas's chest, puts his hand over it, and seals it, and walks away. And I, as I prayed, and I'm looking at that going, okay. I prayed like, Lord, what on earth do I do with that? And he's like, you need to tell Thomas that I'm placing a seed in his heart for the next season to sustain him in his faith. Ashley is going to go. Now you tell me, what you going to do with that? It's where you got to be wise. And so I walk over to him. I did not share the part about the Ashley will go. And people can not agree with that. But I said, I was like, brother, I just want to tell you that I just feel like the Lord put a seed of faith inside of you to sustain you through this next season. Can I pray for you? And he was crying, and I prayed for him. So after she passed, he and I sat down for a pizza a couple of weeks ago in Waco, and we talked about this thing. And I said, man, I, I really feel like the Lord was just bringing that. Do you feel like that, that was something that was legit? And he's like, yeah, like the, the Lord just, just carried me through the season. Can it be predictive? Yes. The problem with that is um, um, people abuse it. And so, uh, again, there are many uh, religions and Christian uh, sects and cults today that the people just proclaim that they know when the end of the world is coming. Uh, By the way, you know where most prophets that have said they knew when the end of the world was coming are? Do you know where they are? And you know how far past it is the date? There was a dude, you know that guy recently that was doing that? He changed his mind like six or seven times. All right, uh, I feel like the Lord's going to take us on July 1st, uh, 2012. 2012 came. What did he do? Ah, I felt like I heard that wrong. <laughs> I feel like the Lord's going to take us in November of 2013. And here's the only reason I'm saying, I don't even, I'm not even saying that I think these people are out just trying to be wicked. What I'm saying is that the scripture is clear. Concerning the day or the hour, no one knows. Not the angels in heaven, nor the Son, not even the Son, but only the Father. 
And so when you hear things like that, there are some, because this is why people go from one extreme to the other. Just because you believe in prophecy and God still talks doesn't, believe you, you think, doesn't mean you believe you know when the end of the world is. That is garbage. There have been books and time spent, cults started on the return of the Lord, and the scripture says only the Father knows. Jesus doesn't even know. Here's another one. I've only got about 62 of these left, and we'll get out of here. Some people believe that prophecy is just for the end times. So if you read through scriptures and Revelation, there are these two guys that come at the end and they're prophesying over the nations. And some people will say, well, hey, the, the end times, that prophecy stopped with the apostles and uh, prophecy will only come back in the end times. And so as you look at that, and so it, this is a myth yet not myth. Here, here's the deal. Joel, the prophet Joel, we've talked about this verse before in chapter two is prophesying the day of the Lord, the end, the end of things, the God, when God comes back and his fulfillment start to work out on the face of the earth. And here's what he says. It shall come pass to, uh, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Everybody say prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. People will look at this and say, see, only on the end days will God pour out those kind of prophecies and revelations. The problem with that is if you move on to see the birth of the church, Peter grabs this verse out of, out of the heart of the scriptures and he pulls it down. Peter, the apostle, full of the Holy Spirit. And here's what he says in Acts 2, 14 through 18. That day that he was talking about is now. The day that the prophet, he quotes Joel 2. He says, that day that he prophesied that we would speak and prophecy will fall on men and women, even servants. He said, it's now. These are the end days. This is the eschaton. And, we, and this is another theological argument I, I don't really care to argue with many of you about. But it's even in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 2, the, the, the writer of Hebrews says, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. There, there is this clarity, this eschaton, that this is the last season, but it's not the year 2018 or 2019. It is the age from the resurrection of Christ and the birth of the church until Jesus comes back. That's why we're supposed to be feverish. That's why we're supposed to look out because nobody knows the day. Nobody knows the hour. The Lord is coming. We're supposed to stay awake. These are the days of the final day. So uh, the point is, is prophecy just an end times thing? Yes. Welcome to the end times. 2000, zero, zero, party over, oops, out of time. Um, here's another thing, uh, just to recoup this one. Um, this one on here. Prophecy is only for preaching and teaching God's word, a word from the Lord. Um, Dave Guzik, a guy who I, I really like about this stuff, says this. Oftentimes, people who believe the miraculous gifts have been removed from the church wish to define prophecy as preaching. Though this is common, it is inaccurate. There is a Greek word for preaching and a Greek word for divinely inspired speech. Paul uses the word for divinely inspired speech, not preaching. Although good, spirit-anointed preaching will often use the spontaneous gift of prophecy. It is inaccurate to define prophecy as good preaching. So when I'm here and I'm preaching, I count on and listen to and pray that while I am preaching God's word, he is revealing through the Holy Spirit his word, his direct word from the scriptures. I, want, I hold that very seriously. Uh, I, I, I want to hold on to it with dear life. I tremble when I walk up here every Sunday. I never walk up here nilly-willy thinking the preaching word of God is just something for the anointed and I just happen to be on his A-team list, Right? I, I tremble at preaching God's word, but I also have learned over the years to pray for God to reveal things to us specifically from his word and from his heart that applies in a prophetic way. Like, you know, when I'm preaching and you'll see me go, what? I'll sidebar and it's not in my notes. And I'm like, hey, I really feel like this is from the Lord. Test us. Like he does that a lot. Like he does that a lot, but it is not just teaching. It is a divine revelation in a minute for a purpose for a point. Amen. So here's a closing truth about prophecy, which as I was writing this, I bawled in my office like a big heavyweight baby. Uh, here's a point. There's the truth about prophecy. It's going to come to an end. The scriptures talk about prophecy ending. 
Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 12. Uh, Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, who is the perfect? When the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly. But then, when the perfect comes, uh, then we'll see face to face. Now I know in part, but then, when the perfect comes, I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. See, prophecy is going to go away, and that is not a sad thing. Because the reason why prophecy goes away is because we won't be holding on and begging for scraps of God's Word or listening for specific revelation. We will be in the presence of revelation himself. We will be with the King. And so you can call it whatever you want, but prophecy that we know on the face of this earth and how it works out in the church, it is a good thing, but someday it's going to die because real life will be in front of us. We will hug him, embrace him. You will feel, the I, I imagine, the, the breath of the, of, of the Lord on your neck. You will directly hear his voice standing in front of him. Amen? When the perfect comes, now in part, and so I love this. He talks about this mirror. And so you, what happens when you look in a dimly lit mirror? Or when, when you look in a mirror and you're looking at yourself, what do you see? You see yourself, but do you see yourself clearly? No. So in the meantime, what do we do between now and the perfect comes? This is why prophecy is such a gift. Prophecy is letting us see glimpses of picture and glory and hearing the word of God, hearing his heart for us, feeling the embrace of his arms around his church for the edification of us, for the love of us, for those of us who were going to be honest and say, I need to hear from the Lord. Guess what? He does that. The other day I was on FaceTime with Noah, my son in Waco, and they have bad internet down there. Not not all of Waco as a whole, but in the house that he's staying. So he and I are FaceTiming, and all of a sudden, you know, when the reception gets real bad, and all of a sudden, he's like, you know, and then I'm, you know, I'm like telling him I squandered his inheritance in the middle of that. But, but in there, it freezes. And all I see is a picture of him kind of morphed and but I can hear his voice. And we go back and forth like that for like five minutes. And in that five minutes, and, and, and as I was praying last night, just looking for a good illustration, I felt like this is a modern day mirror application. Uh, it's it's kind of like that. It's kind of like we have reception with the father. But guess what? Uh, I can see my son, I can talk to my son, but soon and very soon, I'm going to be with my son. I'm going to hug him. I'm going to love him. I'm going to whoop his rear if I need to. That's a sidebar. He's a good boy. I don't need to do that. But I will gladly take the presence of my son over my stupid phone any day. But in the meantime, if you think just in waiting for that day, I'm going to not value and treasure this because it's what I get of him, anticipation of that day, it's ridiculous. I'm going to talk to him every chance that boy will answer his phone. I'm going to love on him every chance again. I want to hear his voice. Even though it's not 100% the way it's going to be, it's a gift to me now. I can still hear from my boy, and he can still hear the word of his daddy speaking to him. I would never, ever trash that just waiting for what's coming because this is precious. On the other hand, I would never value this over what I'm going to get because I'm going to be with him. Same with the thing with the Lord. The Lord, I just gave a ridiculous FaceTime analogy of the presence of God. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm almost like one of these modern hipster preacher guys, right? Here's the deal. How do, how do we pursue this? So if this is all true, and again, through these gifts, you don't have to agree with me on 100% everything. That's, that's up to you. But I think the core of what we've talked about is clear. We must pursue these gifts. We must pursue it. So when it comes to prophecy, listen, if prophecy really is the heart of God speaking to his people, especially when we gather together, why on earth would we not pursue that? Why wouldn't we make room in here? I will not allow the fear of what people think about us on the outside that we've gone crazy and wacky rob us from the presence and the voice of God in here. 
Because what happens? You want to know what takes place over wacky? When God, when people have an actual revelation from the Lord, when they see God work, when they see him move, when they get their hearts broke and challenged and lifted, that is when the church is doing what the church is supposed to be doing. Amen? We got to be bold. We got to get over this weirdness garbage. We got to get over the fear of being wrong. You know how you work through prophecy? You walk up to someone and say, hey, um, okay, I uh, need to test this. Uh, but I feel like uh, there's a picture of an allergy and you stepped in dog dew and something happened over here and you go, no, that's dumb. You don't say that because you want to encourage the other person. What do you do from that? You walk away and do you give up? No, you said something. Does a man get it right every time? By the way, if you run into somebody who thinks they have the word of the Lord all the time, run away from them or kick them and then love them back into the kingdom the right way. Amen? Well, I'm going to have to take that one out of the podcast. <laughs> don't listen to them is what I'm trying to say. Um, pray that God would give you a word. Like, man, one of the most intimate things you can do is, Jesus, um, I don't want to be weak, but, Lord, your Bible seems to say that I can hear from you. Jesus, would you put that on me? Would you give me a word for somebody? Would you, would you speak to me and have an environment here where we can practice and fail in our services? Our heart is, listen, you think we're wacky now? Uh, we're going to start this year a training of prophetic ministry where people are going to be trained up the biblical way on how to share and walk through what God is doing if they have that gift to be able to pray over people in our services or, or down the hall. Like we want to incorporate, they actually have a team of people with these gifts. And by the way, Scripture's clear that seem to be people that have these gifts that happen a lot, but guess what? It says all of us can, all of us can receive a word from the Lord. All of us, and we're called to pursue it. Amen? So how does this build up the body of Christ? Seems a little redundant and silly, but it is literally the God of heaven directly communicating to his kids. It builds our faith and it helps us in our intimacy with Jesus, and it witnesses powerfully to the unbelieving. What are some indicators that you might have this gift? How do you know that God might be putting this on you? It's a legitimate question. You need to ask yourself, how do I know? Sometimes I got things, and I don't know if it's spiritual gas or whatever. Here's the deal. Um, Number one, I didn't put this on. You need to be around people who know. I didn't put this up there, but you need to be around people with the gifting that can help you walk through that, that you trust biblically. Um, but you are sensitive to what the Lord is saying in certain times to certain people. Like, God will just impress you like his heart. You, you feel like you start thinking these thoughts like, oh, I really feel like Jesus is saying this to Renee in this season. That's weird. I don't want to tell her that. Those kind of things start to happen where you feel like you know, um, might know God's heart in something. You get revelations about things of God that don't contradict his word. You're hungry to hear from the Lord. Here's a big, big, big one. You desire deep intimacy with him. You cannot have a good listening conversation relationship with the Lord if you do not pursue him and his voice. Reading and diving and just completely consuming his word and listening for his voice. Some of us need to just simply incorporate listening time into our prayer. This is hard for people like me. I think I'm functioning if my this is running. But sometimes we have to stop and say, okay, Jesus, just practice in your quiet time. Jesus, I just want to hear from you. And then you got to chase and beat the 10,000 squirrels around in your head, but you're okay. Amen? Be still and know. That's right. And um, you feel a prompting that you might know in a large heart for someone is in a season of life, and people confirm this gift. You know, I always want to add that at the end. People should confirm a uh, gift. That wasn't from the Lord. <laughs> oh, that, I feel like that was really good. That was really from the Lord. I feel like God was speaking. Here's how that relates to me. So let's, let's go back to the boom. The Lord is a father who is near to his children. He speaks to us through his word and directly to our hearts through one another with revelations of who he is and what his heart is for us. As we close this whole series, this is uh, all I can do is just share with you what I feel like he has been leading us through, but it's this, he's here. He's here. Like, he's not far away magnifying God. He's here. He's working through us. You are his sons and daughters. And if you're not, you can be. 
his sons and daughters with laying your life down. It starts with a prayer, but it's a life of laying down your heart to him and saying, God, I want some of that. I want your grace and mercy and forgiveness. And then I want you to, Lord, I just want to live for you and edify the church and be a part of what you're doing. God, I surrender my life to you. But here's the deal, sons and daughters, your father is very aware of what your heart needs. And he is not cold and distant. He is close as a good father, and he is intimate with his children. He's always been intimate with his kids. Even the ones in rebellion that he was only speaking to through a few, he still spoke to them, gave them promises, gave them hope, gave them joy, gave them life. In this age, we would say even more so that he lives in us that we would hear the heart and word of God. The question is, whatever side of the camp you're on, or if you're in the middle, are we as a church open and willing and ready to say, Jesus, I lay down my misconception. I lay down my fears. And I just want everything your word says you have for me. Jesus, I want to hear your voice. And so this morning as we go into worship, literally this is where these things happen. The scripture says when we're gathered in public setting in church, when we are here to worship, prophesy. Prophesy. Seek the word from the Lord and share it and pray for that in one another. Uh, I challenge first service, so this is what I do with myself. Just sit there, get in the worship and say, Jesus, I don't want to close the door. So if you have something to say, Lord, would you please, please speak? And for some of you, Father, I feel like you're so far away from me, no matter what I say or believe. Lord, I just need a touch from you. Would you fall? And by the way, I'll end with this. What would you tell your children if they came to you and asked you that? Mama, I just need to sit with you. <laughs> I just need to hear your voice, Dad. What would you say to your babies? And then turn that around between you and the Father heart of God. What do you think he says? He's a good father. 